Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Advancing Cleaning and HVAC Tools for Disinfection. I'm Neil Eisenberg, Vice President of Marketing with Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by OpenWorks. Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive, will be joining us shortly. Before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. First, please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions via the question box contained in that panel. You can send in questions at any time, and these will be addressed after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure the panel is expanded so you can access the question box. If at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send a message to us via that question section, and someone on our team will answer you privately. And if you're interested in continuing education credits, please note that you'll receive a certificate of attendance in an email from facility executive after this webinar. You can report this to your association for continuing education credits. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Your experts today are Craig Hammontree and Brian Hall. Craig is National Operations Manager for OpenWork, having joined the company in July 2018 as a regional director. He has more than 25 years of management experience, garnered in a variety of industries in the disciplines of information technology, customer service, business development and sales, small business owner startups, operations, and project management. He currently oversees operations for OpenWorks access to the Midwest regions, as well as franchise development. Prior to coming to OpenWorks, Craig worked for a large investment group launching their startups and sat on their board for troubled businesses. He developed and created their first franchise model for PME products, along with the role of CEO and COO for two of their most successful startups to date. He has designed and implemented two different sales organizations for IT organizations, as well as managed multiple large scale projects. Brian Hall has been in the HVAC wholesale business for over 14 years and currently works for a refrigeration supplies distributor, the largest family owned HVAC wholesale business on the West Coast. He has been a resource for HVAC contractors and building owners across the West Coast to discuss indoor air quality, verification, and strategies to reduce contaminants in the air while still maintaining energy efficiency. Brian has been through multiple manufacturers training to learn different strategies to accomplish these goals. And now I'll turn it over to Craig and Brian. Welcome, Craig. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we've got a lot of information for you today, and so I'll just, uh, we'll get right to it. So today's agenda, um, you know, with the onset of COVID-19, you know, all the different viruses and things that are coming around during this time, um, deep cleaning and disinfection to remove, you know, viruses and other infectious diseases, um, it's become critical to provide the safe and healthy environment that our employees are looking for. Um, commercial cleaning has taken to a new level. Uh, we HVAC has also been an industry that has uh, risen to the needs of our of our customers as far as doing air air purification things like that through your HVAC systems. We'll be talking about that later. But as you can see in the uh, today's agenda, we'll be looking at surface disinfection technology, indoor air quality. Uh, what's the right program for you? Um, how do you verify and monitor these types of things? And a little bit about OpenWorks, and then we'll open it up to some Q&A. So to kick this off, we're gonna kind of look at surface disinfection technology and different things that are out there. So there's, a, there's kind of a uh, misconception in there, and the CDC has kind of given us some guidelines on when you look at cleaning versus disinfecting. Um, a lot of people are out there with their cleaning and they're, they're, they're using chemicals that basically just clean, soap and water basically, maybe with a little bit different of a pH balance. Um, then going back and doing some disinfecting is another option as well. But then that promotes a, you know, a dual cleaning strategy and takes more time, costs facilities a whole lot of uh, extra costs that they don't need to incur. Um, so, Looking at these different things, how do how do we do this? There are chemicals out there that do cleaning and disinfecting at the same time. But how often and frequently should you choose to disinfect? You know, it's kind of up to you as far as how your facilities, how your facilities work. So you look at, you know, is there any COVID-19 in your community? You know, 
low number of people wearing masks. You know, with with the mask mandates kind of falling off, um, you know, there's going to be some. <clears throat> there's probably going to be some infestation of the COVID-19 and other viruses that could possibly come up. Um, you know, is the space occupied by certain populations, such as people that you know have a sensitivity to this, or high risk for COVID-19 and possibly death? So you look at your facility and you say, okay, what do I need to do? And these were all kind of new things that are coming out from the CDC, and this actually updated, you know, on April 5th by them. Um, so keeping on top of what the CDC is talking about, what they're doing. Um, there's other resources that we'll point out later on in the presentation that will help you keep on top of, you know, what what is out there? What do, what do we need to be aware of? And what does our facility actually have um, when it comes to the population within it? So as we look at disinfectants, <clears throat> there's different ones out there. Um, if you look at the EPA website, you can go in and look at the disinfectants that are on their list in. You know, when COVID first came out, there really wasn't any claims out there that any disinfectant would kill COVID-19. Over the year, over this last year, um, you know, this, the EPA, you know, went through a rigorous uh, looking at different chemicals and seeing which ones would actually kill the virus. And now they have over 400 surface different disinfectant products that the EPA have deemed safe and effective against the virus. So making sure that you're looking at the, the list on the EPA, if you have cleaners that are in your space going into their janitor closet and seeing, you know, are they using the correct chemicals? Um, is this chemical on the list? The other important thing that you want to see is what is called dwell times. Dwell times each disinfectant has a different, what they call dwell time. How long is the surface wet with the disinfectant chemical? You know, it could be anywhere from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. So you wanna make sure that when the crews are using these types of disinfectants, that they're keeping the surface wet for that amount of time to clean the virus. If they're just putting the, the liquid down and wiping it clean right away, it's really not doing the job that it's, uh, it's supposed to. There's a lot of training that goes into this and making sure that, you know, the workspaces are safe. Um, so making sure, again, look at your disinfectants that you're using, see what the dwell times are, and are they on the EPA list in disinfectant list. Now we're kind of going to look at some different ways to, <laughs> to clean and look at different areas. So the first one I want to kind of point out is steam cleaners. Um, this is, a, this is an effective way of cleaning or disinfecting when it comes to different types of services. Like this one would be for, you know, maybe furniture, things like that, um, curtains, things where you can't really get a disinfectant spray and wipe it clean. Um, steam is a little bit uh, difficult to use because you got to make sure that the temperature is at the right, you know, is hot enough, right? So steam must be used close, you know, close to the surface. So then you have issues with too much water. Um, you know, steam cleaning should be avoided on any kind of surfaces that could, you know, that could be damaged by the water or heat, such as painted surfaces, fabrics, you know, porous type surfaces, brick, marble, things like that. So steam is effective when it comes to like carpet, fabric, you know, things like that. Commercial grade cleaners can be come back on that, and we'll look at another. Um, electrostatic spraying, which we'll talk about in a little while, that can help kind of add to the cleaning of, of, the, of the germs and viruses that are hard to reach. Another option that has come around, and it's been around for, you know, for a while, is the ultraviolet light technology. You know, ultraviolet light is, uh, is already, has been proven that it does kill viruses. Um, it's used widely in uh, medical facilities, uh, they it it hits anywhere the light hits will kill the virus. It breaks it up because it's like a UV light, like the sun. Um, the one thing that you have to be concerned about with the UV light is making sure that it uh, people are not in the space because this is will cause uh, sunburns on the skin. Um, could be fatal in some aspects, so got to make sure that you know we. 
you, you take it very seriously when you put it into the room. They do have some handheld devices that, that I have seen demonstrated where they pass it over the surface. So where it's not pointing up at the, the individual using it, using it, but still a, a, a an effective way of, of killing the germs and the viruses that are needed and like I said, most of these are used in the hospital setting. You're gonna kind of see a little bit of this now, robotics. Robotics have been a uh, kind of very popular in spaces that are not occupied, um, whether that is a school, uh, medical facility, things where people are gone and they're out. Uh, these robots now will do ultraviolet light and <clears throat> do a spray um so that it it does a dual clean you know they've been used in uh, like i said in industrial manufacturing um they have been very effective against the covid 19 and other viruses um they they're the uv lights are zapping the uh the, the virus and breaking them up and, and killing them so and then on top of that they've been used like i said with a with a spray that they spray out so been very very effective One of the most popular, and I think probably almost everyone has heard of this now, is electrostatic spraying. Um, these little guns, and they have ones that are backpacks. They, you know, they help with reducing application time because it's a spray that basically has an electrical charge that goes out and kind of bonds itself to any surface that it hits. So, like on a chair, where you're sitting in a chair and you have the arms that you know, you always take your hands and fold them underneath the armrest. Well, it actually gets underneath there as well because it basically forms to whatever it hits. This has been very, very, very effective and probably most commonly used in most facilities these days. Um, you know, the time that it takes to cover and disinfect all surfaces that are hard to reach has been reduced. Um, it applies the chemical more effectively. It eliminates the danger of overuse. Um, it is a very, very light mist, so it can pass over uh, electronics without damaging them. Um, it gives the, you know, the application of the disinfectant on there long enough to kill uh, the virus. Um, the EPA does consider electrostatic spraying as a low pressure sprayer, so you want to make sure that the chemicals that you're using in there are a low pr pressure sprayer, and it should say that on the left on the label of the disinfectant. You can use almost any disinfectant in these, but we want to make sure that it's on the label that it does work in a low pressure sprayer. The other one that was kind of out before electrostatic kind of <clears throat> started taking off was foggers and misters. Um, foggers and misters. You know, they're really, really good at killing the airborne germs and bacteria. Um, they are great at getting areas that are difficult to clean, uh, behind couches, behind, you know, uh, desks that were, where you can't get a rag to wipe it down. Um, they eliminate, you know, pathogens. Like I said, it's, it, it gets about everywhere, curtains, floors, walls, whatever it might be. Uh, but they're rapid and effective. And they hang around in the air long enough that it does kill an airborne pathogen as well. So if, if you have an area that has been, um, you know, reported that COVID was in there, this is an effective way to do that to make sure that everything is done uh, correctly. The the issues with foggers are the the mist. Um, you want to make sure you have the proper PPE on because the mist can be breathed in because it hangs around so much. So you want to make sure that you're uh, whoever is applying it is using the correct PP, PPE. A new technology that came out is, uh, you know, after the coronavirus was uh, was detected about you know about a year and a half ago, um, is this um, antimicrobial surface protection. This is a product that that lasts anywhere from 24, 30 days, or even longer. Um, we have some that we have seen, and actually OpenWorks uses one that they have a claim for 90 days. So, but once this is applied uh, to the surface and allowed to dry, the solution creates a, a bond that is kind of unique. And we'll kind of go over this a little bit more in the presentation later. But it has a spike structure and a positive electrical charge that actually kills 
the cell walls of the of the uh, of the virus. It's a uh, it's a like I said a fairly new technology, and one that um, I think is we've seen great results from it um, as far as doing testing on the surfaces over a length of time. Now the cleaning products that you use after you apply this have to have a certain pH level uh, to make sure that you don't kill the, the the surface itself. If it's too high or too low on the pH scale, it could um, take the take the protectant off. And with that, I'm gonna transfer it over to Brian. He's kind of gonna go into the uh, HVAC systems that can help with uh, air quality within your facilities. Thank you, Craig. I will be discussing indoor air quality, commonly abbreviated as IAQ, as well as other strategies that can be implemented through your HVAC systems already in place. If you have searched the internet recently for products or strategies for disinfection for your HVAC system throughout your building, you are probably overwhelmed by the number of products and strategies that are suggested. Many products and strategies are being marketed as effective for corona coronavirus disinfection, but how do you know what's best to use in your workplace? So let's get into some of those ideas. Uh, bringing in fresh air is one of the main and best strategies you can uh, do to, to keep your indoor air quality in check. Good ventilation can help to offset the absence of natural wind and reduce the concentration of viral particles and CO2 in your indoor air. The lower concentration of viral air and CO2, the less likely viral particles can come into contact with your eyes, nose, and mouth, or be inhaled into your lungs. Utilizing protective ventilation practices or adding proper interventions can reduce the concentration of air, airborne viral particles and reduce the overall amount that occupants can come in contact with. Please note, OpenWorks is not an IAQ expert. However, they do partner with specialists in the field to provide you with the best information and newest technologies available. Uh, according to the CDC, you will want to ensure that ventilation systems in your facility are operating properly. In many cases, the existing fresh air intake on HVAC systems has been partially closed down or even completely closed off, allowing little or no fresh air into the building. Most building codes have, all, have already required a minimum amount of fresh air into your building, even before the coronavirus. Now it has become even more crucial. The closing of fresh air dampers was typically done to enable energy savings and put less wear and tear on the HVAC unit by not allowing hot summer, summertime air into the building that needs to be mechanically cooled by the compressors of the AC unit. Fresh air is typically brought in through the HVAC system by use of a fixed fresh air damper or a modulating fresh air economizer, or could be also done uh, through makeup air units. Uh, here we have strategies for improving the ventilation and indoor air quality of your buildings. You can do things such as increase the percentage of outdoor air through your HVAC system. This can be accomplished by opening those fresh air dampers to a higher operating percentage, or you can program e your economizers, if you have them, to bring in more fresh air. Uh, we can consider using natural ventilation, such as opening doors or windows if it's safe to do so. This again will help to dilute the stagnant indoor air with fresh outside air. However, this only makes sense if the conditions outside are optimal and is allowed at your building. We can improve central air filtration. This is accomplished by increasing the MERV rating of air filters installed. You'll want the highest MERV rating filters you can possibly have without significantly diminishing the designed airflow or putting too much static pressure on your HVAC unit. Historically, in commercial buildings, we see MERV ratings of about seven to 10 uh, for the filters that have been installed historically. And we're starting to see a, a push to using MERV 13 filters. Uh, they're becoming much more popular and are collecting much more uh, particles and dust in them. Our next strategy is called demand control ventilation. This is basically a cross between energy saving strategies while also meeting fresh air initiatives. And you do this by actively monitoring the indoor air quality of the space. Uh, you would have to have an economizer tied to a CO2 sensor that, that is in the occupied space. 
The CO2 sensor monitors the building's ability to ventilate occupied spaces to be sure the air is staying clean. It then allows us to adjust how much fresh air is coming into the HVAC system through the economizer, while also looking at the outside air temperature and humidity to decide if it makes sense to run the mechanical cooling compressor, or does it make more sense uh, to just bring in fresh air and we can cool the building off in that way. Uh, demand control ventilation can also eliminate other common strategies, such as running your HVAC system for two hours before an occupied period to clean the air, or opening fresh air dampers to a higher percentage that we're not necessarily sure that we need. Uh, while utilizing the CO2 sensor, we'll be monitoring the quality of the air in the building and we'll only bring in fresh air when we need to in order to satisfy our, our air quality standards, or if it makes sense to do so from an energy saving standpoint. It's truly the best of both worlds. Our next strategy is generating clean to less clean air movements. This is done by reevaluating the positioning of supply and exhaust air diffusers or dampers and adjusting zone supply and exhaust flow rates to establish a measurable pressure difference. Uh, you can have staff work in clean ventilation zones that do not include your high risk areas, such as visitor reception or exercise uh, facilities. Effectively, this means if you have an area that is considered to be less clean or is highly occupied, you can use an exhaust fan to remove the air from that part of the building and not let it recirculate throughout the building's main duct ductwork. Keep in mind, in order to keep the building pressure balanced, you will need makeup air units to replace any air that is removed by an exhaust fan. Uh, our last one is to install an indoor air quality device into your HVAC ductwork system. Uh, it's a great, great strategy to help clean the air. Uh, there are many products in the market that utilize different strategies for purification, uh, such as UV lights, like Greg was mentioning, uh, ionization, and other products out there that, that produce some sort of vapor hydrogen peroxide or photocatalytic oxidation. Uh, we'll discuss more of these in detail shortly. Uh, next slide, please. So monitoring the indoor air quality through an HVAC system can bring uh, cost savings to your building, sustainability, and comfort with real-time data on temperature, humidity, and CO2 levels, all in an easy-to-use platform. Studies have shown that more control of temperatures and monitoring of CO2 levels reduces the stress level of your workforce, customers, and tenants, in turn raising the productivity and satisfaction levels. A good energy management system will provide 24 seven real-time intelligence for the environment of the occupied space. These systems can also help to identify overspending on air conditioning or heating as well. Ideally, we want our control system to alert facility managers if temperature gets too high, humidity gets too high, or CO2 gets too high. Um, identifying these problems before they get out of hand, we can address them quickly and uh, take care of any problems before they really arise. Uh, a control system that I suggest and, and I use common is called Pelican Wireless. It, it's a uh, very uh, good system, uh, great value, and provides everything that we were just talking about. Um, it does require the installation by a qualified HVAC company. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we'll talk about devices that can be installed into your HVAC duct systems that are already in place. Uh, these are all marketed to clean the air. The three most common strategies for these devices are UV, ionization, and vapor hydrogen peroxide. Although there are many products on the market that claim to clean the air, most utilize the same technologies as what we discussed and, and may offer only one or up to all three uh, of those. UV has been one of the longest standing technologies most people are aware of. Uh, UV lights can definitely de disinfect surfaces. However, it does take dwell time for the light to work effectively. Although this is a great strategy for non-moving surfaces, air in, in the HVAC system is almost always moving. It can pass through the UV light so quickly that the air does not become completely disinfected. Instead, UV lights are used to disinfect the inside of an AC unit itself. The inside of the HVAC unit is a, a very dark and moist place. This creates a breeding ground for bacteria and mold. 
By using a UV light positioned to, to shine on the evaporator coil, it can keep the inside of the AC unit clean and disinfected. UV lights work at their peak as soon as they are installed and start losing effectiveness uh, over time. Bulbs will usually need to be replaced every one to three years, depending on the manufacturer's recommendations. Ionization is the uh, second most common one. Uh, it utilizes a strategy of producing negative and positive ions to generate clean air in the same way that nature produces clean air. Ionization is naturally occurring uh, all the time uh, and is, uh, it's what gives the, the clean air smell when you're at a beach or in the forest um, on top of a mountain, that's nature producing ions. Uh, because the ions are both negatively and positively charged, they can be attracted to each other and cling to, cling to contaminants in the air. Uh, this changes the molecular, molecular makeup of virus strains and effective, effectively neutralizes them. In addition to neutralizing viruses, the technology will also attract uh, to other particles in the air, and it turns microparticles into slightly larger specks of dust. Uh, now these, these specks, or I'm sorry, the particles that were small enough to pass through the air filters are now becoming larger and being able to be caught by that air filter. This effectively increases the, the air filter MERV rating, um, and it can take additional stuff out of the that it couldn't have before. What can be considered a downside of this technology though, is particles that are suspended in the air may not make it back to the air filter. As they become larger and heavier, they can fall out of the air and land on your surfaces. This will make a room dustier and appear to be more dirty than it, than it is. Although what we actually have done is clean the air and made it so you're, you are now not breathing in all those particles that are now sitting on the surfaces. This extra dust is usually at its worst within the first couple of days after installation. However, there is always new dirt and particulate being introduced into a indoor space. So you're always going to have additional dust. Uh, there are typically no replaceable parts for ion generation devices. However, it is important to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for cleaning the device. Uh, typically it can be done at the same interval as replacing your air filters and can be done at the same time. Uh, the last technology is a vapor hydrogen peroxide, uh, or also can be called photocatalytic oxidation. This is achieved by, a shining, by shining a UV light on a cell that acts as a catalyst. The process produces an off-gassing of vapor hydrogen peroxide that will get distributed through the supply air ducting of the building. This vapor hydrogen peroxide cannot be seen, however, it is landing on surfaces and disinfecting wherever it lands. The UV light and catalyst cell have a relatively long life. However, they will need to be replaced every few years per the manufacturer's recommendations to keep up on their effectiveness. Uh, there are not very many products on the market that can offer all three of those technologies in one package. Um, one that I suggest is the Dust-Free Active. It does come standard as an ion generating device uh, with photocatalytic oxidation. Uh, it does have the ability to then add a UV light that you can put in and shine on that evaporator coil to keep that clean as well. Uh, please remember air purifiers are best used to provide enhanced air quality for your employees. However, it is not recommended as a replacement for proper physical disinfection of the workplace environment. With that being said, I'll turn it back over to Craig to discuss what is best for your facility. All right. Thanks, Brian. So, with all these different technologies and everything that's out there from electrostatic sprayers to air purifiers to the EPA's list net list in disinfectants what's you know what's the right program for your facility <clears throat> you know we looked at different types here like I just said electrostatic foggers um, it's a product comparison of everything that they do and what they don't do so you know, reach out to your, your company that's cleaning your facilities. They should have this information. They should be able to put together a plan that works best for your, your facility. You know, whether it might be steam cleaners, you know, they're a great option for soft surfaces like carpet and fabric, but best practice is to follow the steam cleaning with a disinfectant clean. You know, it is important to, you know, and 
important to note that the EPA did not approve equipment technology, but only chemicals um, for disinfecting. Um, you know, we looked at UV lighting, different ways to use that, right? You can use it as a robot, you can use it as a handheld, you can put it into your HVAC systems, um, but want to make sure that that's the right way you want to go because the, the expense and, and what you have and what your budget offers, you just want to make sure that you talk to talk to someone to give you some advice. So cleaning and verification and monitoring, you know, your ability not only to do the work of the cleaning, disinfecting, air quality control, but to also ensure your building occupants um, know and feel confident that, you know, everything's being done correctly. You know, in, the re in a recent survey that uh, OpenWorks did uh, back in December uh, about the COVID vaccine, the cleaning, uh, we researched about 450 employees across various industries, and we found that one third of the employees really didn't think that their employers were doing enough to keep their workplace clean and disinfected. Um, the same survey we found that you know employees are all, all, you know deciding whether they're going to get the vaccine or not get the the vaccine. So what can you to do? What can you do to ensure that your building and your your employees feel safe? Uh, and people that are entering your buildings, whether it's a customer or a student or whoever it might be. So looking at, you know, different things that can be done. While, you know, many facility managers, you guys have done a, a phenomenal job um, over the year, just making sure that your facilities are up to speed and getting cleaned and being disinfected. But you wanna make sure that you're using people that are trained and certified service providers. Uh, there's a lot of training that goes into this. Um, we we work with all of our cleaning crews on a regular basis to make sure they're up to speed on the new uh, information that comes out. Um, it's a it's a constant you know monthly training that new things, new chemicals, new procedures, new things from the CDC, the EPA, um, you know the World Health Organizations, all of them coming with new ideas, and we stay on top of that and make sure that our cleaners are trained on what's what's new. Um, making sure that your, you know, your your cleaning company is using EPA list in disinfectant products. That's very very important, and they're using the dwell times. Uh, putting together a program that you know is looking at high touch services, you know, light switches, door handles. Um, elevator buttons as it shows here in this in this slide you know just making sure that you guys are special attention to these more frequently touched areas this will help with your uh, with your efforts to control this virus you know another way that you can demonstrate to your employees and staff and visitors as well you know into your facilities that you've taken the measures is by displaying signage um, that lets everyone know that this is being done. You know, you know, people have asked us, you know, what what type of display would you, you know, would you have out there that shows this, you know? But there's different things you can do. There's testing, you know, there's the ATP testing. Um, you know, you could show checklists that hey, this is what we're doing all the time to to get this done. That we you know we're cleaning this daily, we're cleaning, you know, this section, you know, weekly. We're doing, you know, there's a lot that you can. But one of the things that we have found that is the the cheapest and the easiest to do is signage. Um, I know in our facilities that we work with, if we do a we have a COVID outbreak or someone that has come in and said hey, one of our employees had COVID, we go in and we do a special cleaning in those facilities. Well, one of the things that we do is we put up a signage that lets everyone know that, hey, this place, you know that there was an outbreak, but this place has been cleaned and disinfected. And it goes a long way. Um, and it help, helps the employees and your visitors feel, you know, like that you care. Um, ATP testing, it, it can be costly, um, but it will tell you whether, you know, there is bacteria and things living on your desk, your tables, your chairs, things like that. So you can look at that as, as an option. Um, but uh, like I said, there's talk to your providers, the people that are cleaning your offices and your, your schools or your, your healthcare facilities, make sure that they are, um, you know, they have the knowledge they need to make sure that your employees feel safe. But here's some of the resources that I've been talking about, you know, during the presentation. You know, EPA, CDC, um, OSHA, World Health Organization. 
these are great avenues for you to get updated information on a regular basis. Um, we, like I said, OpenWorks does works with our crews constantly on updating anything that comes out from these organizations to make sure they're up to speed on what's what's happening, what to use, how to use it. Um, and like I said, not just for COVID-19, but for any of the viruses out there to help, you know, keep people in the workplace and keep them well. So a little bit about OpenWorks. Um, if you haven't heard from us, we, we have been around for about 35 years. Um, we do have 23 regional offices across the country. Um, we operate in all 50 states. Um, we have a huge number of service providers. Um, we have facilities, you know, 55,000 plus. The one thing that I'm very, very proud of is our customer retention rate, and that's 98%, when the average for uh, the industry is around 53%. So it's uh, we really we really pride ourselves on that. We really work hard to keep our customers and know that they feel safe um, with the provider that they've chosen. You know some of the advantages, like I said, we talked about uh, just on the last slide is you know we've been around since 1983. Um, nationwide network of elite providers, like I said, we train them constantly. We work with them on an ongoing basis, making sure they know exactly what to do, how to do it correctly. And that's not just in disinfecting, but that's in all aspects of uh, keeping your facilities clean, safe, and where you're excited to go to work and have a nice environment. Um, our 98% co uh, customer retention rate is above average. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to say that. Um, all of our products that we use when it comes to disinfecting are e on the list in from the EPA. So we make sure that uh, on a, uh, a regular basis, we're checking with our cleaners, making sure they're using the right disinfectant. So you can be assured that that is being done. Um, we use the CDC and OSHA standards when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting, and all of our, our crews are GBAC uh, disinfectant certified. So we, they go through, like I said, a rigorous training to make sure they know exactly, you know, we talked about dwell times, very, very important. Make sure that they understand that how to do things, how to spray, what PPP to, to wear while they're doing these types of uh, functions. So what we, what OpenWorks did during this time of, of COVID is we started looking at the way we were doing business and, and what, the, what the industry and what the customers were asking for. So we put together a program called TotalWorks. And one of the things that we came with was Total Works with Continuous Care. And I'll kind of go into that a little bit more uh, in depth. This is the, the microbial surface uh, that will help a more your disinfectant make it more productive and, and get rid of the virus uh, a lot longer. So one of the things we did is we looked at, okay, where do people touch the most, right? What does cleaning and disinfectant, what does that include? What does Total Works all about? You know, you've got, you'll see Sani Services, uh, infected guard and infected guard plus so you can see a list here of all the things that we have on our list we call a scope of work that we make sure that we hit every single time we go in for a cleaning um, based off of the scope of work that you pick so as i said we put together sani services so we have sani care sani works and sani tech um, these were looking at different facilities. Like I said, you have to look at your facility and what is best for you. So this is an ongoing, you know, scope of work for your for your facility. You can look at cleaning workspaces daily, restroom and kitchen daily on the Santa Care, all of those works tech all daily. The thing where, where it starts to be a little bit different is what what do you really need? What do you, you know, are you needing more disinfectant than someone that's maybe you know doesn't have that many people that are in and out of the building you know or do you have like a, a school or a a medical facility where you need someone there multiple times a day doing disinfecting and hitting those high touch like i said when people see people cleaning they feel more safe right so we have put together packages and things that we can customize for each of your of your uh, your facilities Then we also looked at this and said, okay, well, what happens when we have a, a, uh, a coronavirus? Um, someone comes in and says, hey, I've, I've conducted this. I, I, I have coronavirus. 
we have to go in and do a special cleaning. So we put together these types of, uh, these two different, uh, one time where we come in, we do the clean, whether it's Effectigard or Effectigard Plus, um, it's a six-step process. Expectagard Plus is a six-step process that was um, put together by GBAC, and um, it's been certified. It's it's something that people feel safe, and like I said, we put a certification up that it has been done. So people, when they come back to work, they look at this and go, they know that their place is clean now, and there is no no viruses around. We've talked a lot about continuous care, uh, the, the antimicrobial surface protection. Uh, this is kind of a, a picture that kind of helps kind of say what this is about. So I talked about the spiky structure. The, the, each one of these spikes is electrically charged. So as the, the virus comes down and tries to hit the surface, it has no flat surface to stick to, which breaks open the walls and makes it, it, it kills it. Um, whereas a flat surface that's been unprotected, it sits there and lingers for quite a few days, as we've talked about or you've heard that, you know, depending on the surface type, how long the virus will actually stay around, and some surface up to seven days. So you have to be making sure that you're cleaning on an ongoing basis. This gives you this continuous care, uh, gives you a little bit more uh, peace of mind that the bacteria is being, being eliminated. And this is a this is a product here that you can actually, like I said, reach out to your your uh, people that are cleaning your your facilities and ask them about it if you're interested. But it's applied through a uh, electrostatic sprayer, so it's actually wrapping itself around um, chairs, tables, desks, whatever it might be. Now, one of the things that um, we've introduced it at OpenWorks is because of our relationships with uh, uh, with Brian and then we put together our own HVAC surface. So we can actually not only look at and bring in the right people um, such as Brian to to install some of these, you know, UV lights or itemization or anything like that. We also can do your maintenance as well on your on your HVAC system, whether that is, you know, belt changes, coil cleans, you know, or all the way up to difficult jobs is replacing a complete unit. So if you like to consolidate some of your um, your vendors, uh, OpenWorks is here to help you with that as well. Um, we do, you know, preventative maintenance and all the way up to, um, you know, emergency uh, response. And with that, I am going to open it up for any questions that you guys might have. All right. All right. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Brian. And this is Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you at the very start, but I am here for the Q&A and have been uh, listening in. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, thanks, everyone, for sending in your questions. We will uh, take uh, several of those now. So, okay, um, Craig and Brian, I'm going to put some questions out to you, and whoever wants to um, take them, please feel free. Okay, so the first one, um, there was some talk, I'll focus on disinfection of surfaces for uh, a few moments, a few minutes here. Uh, so do we do have some questions on that. So, uh, Craig, you had talked about uh, open works and um, cleaning to CDC uh, disinfection standards and some of the, and GBAC and some of the other um, you know, programs that you've all been um, working into. So I, I did want, the question was, is frequent disinfection of surfaces still required by the CDC? Um, and I know you had talked about it different facilities, different needs and frequencies, but what have you seen um, over the past, you know, few months as things have been changing? Uh, is that frequent disinfection still um, being required or, or what, are you, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, you know, the CDC is changing, you know, its stance on different things uh, all the time, um, but I look at it as there, we still have quite a few people out there that are, you know, concerned about the coronavirus and conducting the correct, whether that's them getting it and taking it home to a loved one. Um, the frequency um, has gone down a little bit, but I think that it's important not only for coronavirus, but others, but it also keeps your employees healthy as well. So continuing to, to do these types of disinfectant services that you have over the last year is, is something you probably need to look at and say, okay, Maybe not daily, maybe every other day or three times a week, but making sure that that is being done because a lot of cleaners out there are not using a disinfectant cleaner. 
they're just using a cleaning solution, a neutral cleaner to clean your facility. So just making sure that they are using a disinfectant is important. Thank you. And I'm going to stay on that. You just mentioned um, cleaners, cleaning products specifically. And uh, we do have a question about continuous care, the antimicrobial surface protection that you talked about just toward the end of the presentation there. And uh, the question is, does it uh, kill COVID? And so can you talk about that? Yeah. So what it is, is it, it, it is, it does, it, 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 you have to disinfect and clean before you put the, the, the continuous care down. Uh, the, it, it, it must be disinfected from the beginning. But once that surface is down, any, any bacterial that tries to attach itself to the surface will not be able to because of the structure. Like I said, um, I'll back up. I think it's the last slide I had on here. You, you'll see the spikes here that keep it from adhering to to the surface. It has no flats. A virus has to have a flat surface to to set itself on. And if it doesn't have a flat surface, then it will it will break up and die. Uh, with the with the continuous care, it has a an electrical charge as well. So just kind of like um, it grabs onto the virus and pulls it in and kills it at the same time. So that is the uh, that's what um, that's what that product is actually designed for. Thank you. And I'm going to follow on that um, that area of the antimicrobial. Uh, you had also mentioned in the beginning uh, about being sure to, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the cleaning products that are used once continuous care is put on surfaces in a facility, uh, they should be a certain pH. You mentioned something about that. So is there any commentary you can provide there that, that folks should know about? Yeah, so there is. So uh, depending on what product you use, um, you need to make sure you look at the label. The label will tell you what the the pH level on, because some of your cleaners, uh, your disinfectant cleaners could have a low a low pH right around three, um, all the way up to you know some of them are ten. So you want to make sure that whatever product that your cleaning crew is is using for the continuous care or the antimicrobial surface protectant, that they're using the right um, pH level for that cleaning afterwards. Um, if it's too high, it will start knocking it down. If it's too low, the same thing. So you got to want to try to have a neutral disinfectant cleaning. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears for a minute because we do have an HVAC question, and I know that was a, a significant part of the presentation as well. So um, in talking about the keeping building safe in the you know light of um, everything we, we've been dealing with in the past year um, with COVID and, and now with other, you know, obviously viruses and bacteria that have already been uh, on our radar. Uh, can you talk about how frequently uh, we should have our HVAC checked is the question and filters replaced? Uh, so maybe focusing on filters re replacement um, as part of a preventive maintenance program. What do, what do you all recommend as far as filters and then any other aspects you want to mention as well as welcome? Sure. So I can take that one. Um, Thanks, Brian. Filters um, typically being changed quarterly is best. Um, if you're increasing your MERV rating, that means that you're going to be collecting more dust on those filters, and they're actually going to need to be replaced more often. Um, so you might go to monthly or every other month. Um, that's going to be your, your best practice. Um, filters themselves, although they're, they're good for catching stuff in the air, one of their number one priorities is actually to protect the HVAC equipment. Um, it, as the filters load up with dust and, and other contaminants on them, it's going to put more stress on those filters uh, or on the HVAC units and can cause issues down the road with um, low airflow. Uh, so we definitely do want to be changing them at minimum quarterly, um, but if you're increasing that MERV rating, you, you're going to want to change them more often. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, this question, um, I'm not sure if it if it has to do with a facility per se, but I'm going to ask it because these things could have certainly happened in a commercial facility. Um, and, and Craig, this might be more towards you, but of course, um, whoever wants to jump in. Uh, so you talked about ionizers, the the ionizers as um, you know tools for for air quality uh, clean and cleaning. So it says when it the question is when it drops uh, quote unquote dust bunnies on a floor. And if your pet gets it stuck on their paws, is the COVID uh, coronavirus dead and hence can't spread the virus to owners? Uh, is that something that you might comment on? 
Uh, so I can comment on that one as well. Um, the ionizers are actually changing the molecular compound of, of what's in the air, um, so it's killing the coronavirus. Um, different manufacturers have done their, their different studies and each one claims something a little bit different, um, but they have proven to be effective against the coronavirus uh, in different size chambers and different uh, dwell times. Uh, but it's not something that is going to suspend out of the air and land on the ground and then you can pick up um, for a dog or, or even people. Um, we are effectively uh, killing the, the cell that it has. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I, I have um, anything else? I'm sorry, Craig, did you want to jump in? Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll let Brian answer that one. Okay, Okay. then I have, uh, let's see, I think we have uh, one last question uh, to, to wrap it up, unless uh, we get a few more. But the question was, I, you had talked about, it, it has to do with equipment, uh, electrostatic sprayers uh, were one category that you talked about, and then misters and foggers. Can you just reiterate kind of the difference between those? I know there was a chart showing uh, the differences, but also you talked about them in the beginning. Could you could you just describe maybe kind of what the different applications and features of those are? Yeah, so your your electrostatic sprayer, like I said, it puts an electrostatic charge to the molecule, it, the, the vapor that you see coming out of the gun. And what that does is it makes it cling to whatever it touches. It, it literally wraps itself around um, objects. Like I said, if you if you picture yourself in your in your armchair in your desk chair, you, you know you put your hands down and your your hands kind of go over the edge always. Well, it actually will get underneath there. Um, so you're looking at a place that you touch a lot, but necessarily people aren't wiping or disinfecting underneath there, um, or underneath your table, you know your desk where you're you're looking at your desk and you know you clean the top of it, but necessary sometimes you'll touch the bottom of it you know for whatever reason and in, in but no one ever cleans or wipes it down underneath but that's where this the vapor will get in there because of that electric charge the foggers and the misters do not have an electric charge so you will see it's it's a, just a, a it's almost the the um eat or the cdc calls it almost fumigation so if you ever pictured that big tent over a house that you know has has an infestation of some sort like of bugs of some sort they they use a spray or a fogger to go in there and and hit everything and that's what this does is it it, it emits a, a a mist out there and you can control the size of that mist whether it's small or large the problem with that is is that you do not want to get it around electronics um, it will make papers wet um, whereas electrostatic does not um, it, 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 but it fills the room. And so it does, it does a good job of cleaning the room, uh, the air inside the room. Uh, but the person doing it obviously has to wear a respirator, eye, you know, goggles, everything, a, a full suit, uh, because it is, you don't want to sit there and breathe it all the time. So it's, that's kind of the difference. I hope that answered your question. Um, if not, you can uh, definitely reach out to us and we can explain it better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, we do actually have another question, so I will stay on since we have a, to have a few minutes. If um, And I thank everyone for sending in the questions. Uh, and this is about um, high-end residential apartments. And the question specifically is, what is the best policy or strategy uh, in, with cleaning to manage a high-end residential apartment? Uh, because uh, much of the focus has been on the workspace um, and that type of environment. So is there anything specific, whether uh, surface disinfection or HVAC that you would recommend uh, for high end in terms of health and safety? I, I think, and I think Brian could probably add to this with their with their HVAC, but we do a lot of apartment complexes at OpenWorks um, all across the country. Um, you know, as far as inside your common areas, you know, the office or the, the uh, the play area or the, the shared spaces, I'll just call them that. I can't even think what the names of them are now, but uh, cleaning those the same way you would clean any business, um, any kind of room or, or office area or medical facility or school, do the same thing in those areas. Um, the common areas, whether it is hallways, um, things like that, making sure that you're wiping down. If there's elevators, making sure that you're you know wiping those inside there with a disinfectant and help control that. Obviously, inside the rooms, not much you can do there. 
um, but outside those areas, cleaning them the same way you would clean any business um, that you would have to help reduce the spread. It, Brian, I, from a uh, HVAC standpoint, um, if there is any common areas, that would be we'd consider that more of a commercial space. Um, that would be the area where you could monitor your indoor air quality with a CO2 sensor, uh, and it's common to bring in fresh air from the outside. Uh, but for the actual apartments themselves, there's probably not much you can do um, with the exception of in increasing filter changes and MERV rating of the filters themselves or installing some sort of indoor air quality device into each individual HVAC unit, uh, depending on what you have. But you would have to do it on a per ductwork basis for each apartment. Um, so that would, that would be the easiest way. It's not common to monitor indoor air quality with any any device in a um, residential application. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for the question. Um, okay, so we do have time for one last question. Uh, we, they did want to come in, so I didn't. They did keep coming in, so I didn't want to uh, cut us off too early. Uh, this question is um, about the HV, HVAC uh, technicians, uh, whether you know those are outsourced, and of course they're in-house too, and many of our listeners facilities so I, I do want to get to this question and it was uh what what should hvac techs um use to remove and replace air filters uh to keep themselves healthy against covid other viruses uh so uh, when i say use i'm going to take that as whether it's ppe um, or other types of tools can you talk about um, the technician perspective there sure so the the best thing that they can do is is utilize the proper ppe um, wearing gloves while, while removing the air filters and respirators um, or, or something to cover the face. You, you don't necessarily need, um, you know, something too crazy. But um, when, when the air filter is being removed from an HVAC system, the particles that are on it are going to um, get kind of blown up into the air around the technician that is removing those filters. Um, so really being able to cover their face, uh, their nose, their mouth, um, wearing gloves, that's gonna be the best thing that they can do. Uh, I'm not familiar with any other technologies or practices that is going to eliminate um, anything coming off those filters when they are taken out. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, well, I think we've come to the end of the hour and uh, I, I wanna thank both of you for, for your time, for the presentation today and, and all this great information. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you uh, for everyone in the audience for listening in today, for sending in your questions. Um, we appreciate your time. So we also want to thank OpenWorks for sponsoring the webinar today. Uh, a recording of the webinar will be available online at our website, facilityexecutive.com. It will also be available on the OpenWorks website, and that's openworksweb.com. You can, you can see the uh, recording there as well as all the other information that the company uh, has to offer, some of which you've seen today. So we, we uh, invite you to visit their site as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.